three, you can take two. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. Um, good morning, Roger. Good uh, morning, Roger. Uh, injustice is something which I believe may well be unfairly distributed across this planet. But one thing that upsets me is the idea that somebody who has supposedly mastered the art of arithmetic on Channel 4 in the afternoon in between insurance adverts on the programme known as Countdown, Rachel Riley, she appeared on television saying that she is part of an organisation called the Centre for Countering Digital Hatred or something like that. And she's given all of this publicity. She's teaming up with Gary Lineker, Sadiq Khan, uh, Sadiq Khan and uh, David Lammy. Um, and basically the one thing they all have in common, and I hate to bring it down to this extremely low common denominator, but um, is that they are both Remainers uh, and rampant Remainers. They are all anti-Jeremy Corbyn and they supposedly speak for the reasonable left, but they do not. So this promotion of celebrity, uh, just under the surface, they're basically saying, we're against hatred, we're against hatred, we're against hatred. But they don't say, and we cite the case of Diane Abbott, or we cite any form of Islamophobia. In, mm. fact, in fact, the guy, his name is, I think it's Imran Ahmed, I can't remember. He's supposedly the head of this organisation, and he according to the internet, is um, Hillary Benn's ex-special advisor. Mm. Um, some of the other people that come up when you look up on Companies House, uh, there's a guy called Morgan McSweeney, an Irish citizen who I believe is the person that created the Better Together campaign, which was used to house the likes of uh, Chucka Amuna. Uh, and uh, there's another person who does theology at Bristol. She co-authored something on the government's countering extremist website with David Hirsch. Basically, if you do control F anti-Semitism, it's, it's supposed to be about left extremist groups. Mm -hmm. It says anti-Semitism everywhere. It also says those left extremists were likely to vote Remain, by the way, uh, in smaller print. And um, if you type out I-S-L-A-M, that comes up seven or eight times as opposed to about 80 or 90 or 100 for um, uh, anti-Semitism. But Islam only comes up not for Islamophobia, but for Islamism. They, they, they don't even, they decontextualize completely. Um, and uh, yeah, this seems to be the general thrust. So what with Chaka Amuna speaking at the um, Lib Dem uh, thing yesterday, accusing Jeremy Corbyn of being an apologist for Russia. Um, oh dear, it, it's, it's miserable, isn't it, really? And somebody, and Rachel Riley said, oh, I've been accused of being a Nazi and a white supremacist and enabling paedophilia. But the thing is, if you hung around with the likes of, um, in any way, Chucka Amuna and Peter Mandelson, and what's his name? Um, right. Right. It's, uh, these are the it's, people who are behind it. This is Epstein, uh, and Yahoo, all of that stuff. They're coming right in mm. and, and they're doing this. But Johnson, Johnson accused him of being, uh, Corbyn of being loyal to the Kremlin. So you've got all of the media channels, all of the papers and even the celebs. So it reminds me of Harvey Proctor saying, oh, you've got to give me compensation because um, I like beating up children. Mm. It, it, it's degenerated into a kind of tragical farce. Um, I, I was prompted yesterday by something to, to quote Burns' famous poem of uh, On a light on a bonnet of the lady in church. Um, and the closing stanza of that is uh, A what is this, the gift to gear uh, to see each other as others see us, um, or to see ourselves as others see us. And um, that's the problem with this sort of narcissism um, and egotism. It, it, it's simply that um, these people are so busy projecting their own purity onto everybody else, everybody else is, is impure. 
And I'm old enough to remember the where Mary Whitehouse campaigns, uh, you know, about television and stuff. Yeah. And, and and it was true then, and it's true now. Turn over, turn it off. And on Twitter, and I think most of these generate their worldview from Twitter and think Twitter is real. Um, you can block people on Twitter. Um, I know people make a big thing about all of that. But um, if, 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 say, you go to a pub and someone is annoying you or, or, or you know, um, being objectionable to you, you can probably go in the other bar if there's another bar or go to another pub. Um, the, the, or, or you may sort of, you know, sort of say, look, can, can you keep the noise down a bit or something? And then reasonable people will reach an accommodation. And that doesn't happen on Twitter. Things escalate. And it's kind of designed that way. And these people, they have a responsibility to set a good example. And they're not doing. Um, with super injunctions and the whole do as we say and not as we do culture that infects this sort of age of egotistical celebrity, if you like. Um, they are the last people that, 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 you know, we need to be listening to on this. That there was a very good song on the internet four or five years ago uh, called Thank You Hater. And that was very good. Um, and it, it was a com it's a comedy song. If you look it up, it's a thank you, hater. And, and, and it, it's very well produced. I think it was produced by the BBC, but it, it, it points to a slightly different age, a, a less authoritarian and fascistic age, a, a, a pre-Brexit age when voters could still be trusted to do as they're told. Um, and and that's where this is all. <laughs> this is where this is all headed. It, it's uh, you've been a very naughty boy. Uh, you know you've been a very naughty girl. They're infantizing. they they what they see as their audience, right? And when politicians start treating the polity as an audience, when the institutions of state starts treating citizens as customers and consumers um, instead of citizens and part of the polity and of the polity that's when democracy gets into real serious trouble and democracy is in real serious trouble now and the trouble is a symptom may be um, certain people being perfectly beastly to you know say right Rachel Riley um Diane Abbott has, has suffered a lot of this stuff um and and I you know I do feel for her um that that you know there are you know there are instances of this you see some of these things and you think wow you know that, that uh, what is going on in the head of the person that has done that um and, and you have to question the sort of mental stability of, of, of people that are doing that. You know, they're not doing it for comedy or shock jock effect or something. There are, you know, there are people who, you know, are, are, I, I don't believe in, um, you know, diagnosing people in that way and, 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 and psychologicalizing everything, you know, that, that that's... Uh, it kind of trivialises it, I think. Um, but holding up uh, the rare instances of mentally ill people, I would say, um, and then applying that to the generality and using it as a way to shut down legitimate um, challenging of, of these people's views. Um, and this is the problem. Um, you know, celebrity is treated with kid gloves. And, you know, authority is treated with kid gloves and they never get to hear the truth. And uh, when the truth becomes defined as hate speech, you're straight back to Reinhardt and his famous dictum, it is I who says who is the Jew. Yeah. And that is where we're at. Um, you've got uh, 
that's literally what happened in this case. Mm. Uh, she basically, if you look at her Wikipedia and all of this stuff, she says, I'm an atheist. And then she says that one of her grandparents came over, you know, escaped the pogroms. And then it says that she identifies as Jewish. Now, the person who sat next to her on the Victoria Derbyshire show, the one who was Hillary Benn's special advisor, mm. um, I found an article when somebody went around stabbing people in Parliament, this man said, well, you know, I used to be a Muslim or something like that. You know, my family, I have a Muslim heritage and I can't help but see the link between this murder and my heritage. And I'm an atheist now, you know. So it's really interesting the way when there's a murder, this man distances himself from his religion or his background and his culture and pushes the line that he's an atheist and all this stuff whereas she doesn't have any involvement in anything to do with religion at all just thinks that she can get involved in online fights by saying that she stands for this mm. um which you know i'm neither of these things so you know i'm not going to get involved in anything like that but um yeah, it's a case of what you were saying. She decides who the Jew is and she says that she is. And he decides that he's not a Muslim. And so they sit next to each other and no Islamophobia is dealt with. Um, I, I noticed something the other day, Ranjan, uh, which surprised me. Um, I noticed that David Graeber did a tweet saying that he, for the first time in his life, had become uh, afraid to admit being Jewish or something. I, mean, well, I, I think he wasn't saying someone else has said it. I think he was. Rude. And I, I mean, I think he's quite a tough guy. I, I, you know, I think he's yeah, sort of, he was attacking. He was attacking Hodge and Watson, specifically Watson, I think, saying if you go round weaponizing um, people's identity as part of your political, um, you know, one upmanship, then we become the collateral. And so. What he's concerned with, I think, is what Norman Finkelstein said, which mm -hmm. is if somebody generates this idea that the Jewish community, and she, Rachel Riley did this yesterday, is going to leave the country if Jeremy Corbyn becomes prime minister because they're so worried that he's going to kill them, then, um, of course, people who know that's not true but are Jewish are basically thinking, fucking hell, I'm getting blamed somehow for preventing certain things from happening which are good yeah you know, you know what i mean and um, all of that stuff so i think that is the concern with finkelstein and graeber uh norman finkelstein i mean mm. uh, that um that the jewish community is ultimately going to get the blame for something yeah. that many I mean, of them have had nothing I, to do I, with i think that's a, a fair comment and a, 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 oh do you right yeah concern. same here yeah. But the point, the point about it is, is that the, and I think this was David's point, a lot of the people that are indulging in that sort of provocation, they're not Jewish themselves, and so it's all right for them. But, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, they, they, they're not going to have to bear the brunt of it, as it were. So it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like Emmanuel Macron saying, yeah, I'll contribute to the coalition war in Syria by sending a few planes over um but i don't have to go my children don't have to go uh, uh well yeah i mean that's that's uh that's a slightly different question um but but uh okay that's that's also true um but this the you know the, the um this is more like the uh you know you've got a bunch of drunks having a fight in the pub and and you know there's always one gobby guy that never gets involved and he's sort of saying oh go on then whatever and then someone else always has to end up do the fighting for them right. you know I, I i equate these people you know with this and they're more the drunk in the pub sort of you know mm. Mm. this is uh, this paper is in rasmus's bag mm. And uh, you can see it's just on the first degree, mm -hmm. never mentioned mm -hmm. all of those in class. 
Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, New Zealand and would do this afternoon mm -hmm. or stay behind in his homework house right. on Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. And he set himself with really much prepared. Yeah. I'll sit. I'll sit down with him and do it this afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah. So. 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 I mean, this. The whole. The whole anti-Semitism thing, I mean, clearly, if you're Jewish, it's going to be of concern to you. I get that. That's fine. Um, but it's not the only uh, it's not the only atomization that's been going on. OK, um, I mean, I was interested the other day to see the Sam Smith pronouns thing. Um, What's that? I, What's that? Uh, he, he's a pop singer that's decided that um, uh, hey, trans. Right. They now wish to be referred to. So let me see if I can get this right. Um, they, Sam Smith, say that they wish to be referred to as they. It's that, it's hard to do. Not I, you know I don't I I I've no problem. Uh, that Sam Smith wishes to be referred to as something other than he. Um, I just wish someone would come up with an easier way to do it. Now, in Sweden, there is a word for it, and in Swedish, it's much easier to do because uh, the genders are are uh, han and hon. That's he and her, uh, and they come up with a third one, which is hen. And so if you want to be gender neutral, you refer to them as hen and it's a different thing. So it's not on and han, but hen. So if we've got his, her, um, and they, they, because it's so generally used, it's harder to do. Maybe it, I, I find it in Sw that, that in Swedish easier to get my head around. Whereas using they, which is a, a collective noun, yeah, rather than a, you know, a, a singular. They doesn't really work. Well, it does in English, though, because um, I remember. Logic. I, I can't. I... Well, I remember the example that when I was um, doing a bit of learning how to teach English as a foreign language, I think I remember an anecdote, which was back in the days when. So, for example, you have a teenage daughter, right? Mm. And. Um, if um, we were, say, 40 or 50 years ago, then the internet did not exist. And there was usually only one telephone in the house. And when the telephone rang, um, everybody knew it, you know, that somebody had telephoned. And so the telephone rings, uh, the daughter picks up the telephone, speaks to a friend who is male and roughly the same age as her, um, uh, says yes, okay, blah, 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 and puts the phone down. Um, and the father might say, uh, who called? And then the daughter could say something along the lines of either no one or um, uh, someone called, uh, they wanted to know if, you know, our, you know, if, if your son was in, or something like that. You know, and so the they part doesn't involve a lie because it's an uncertain they. So, but we're moving into X and placeholder and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so I think that's the reason why there's some justification for using they. Um, obviously, in the case of myself, what with my lack of delusions of grandeur or anything like that, I suppose I would expect to be called royal excellency or something like yeah, that or, well people call it that like, i've read a little bit about what people are saying it's like the you know the royal we <laughs> not quite a lot you know we are not immune um the, they are not amused or he is not amused we are not amused i i it, it's it is it, it's quite hard to do um and so
I mean, my, my, my idea would be to come up with a better word for it, because it's a, this is completely unrelated, but a similar question. Um, I, I know a whole bunch of anarcho-capitalists, and they describe their sort of nirvana of capitalism or something. And I will always say, well, that doesn't fit any of the categories of capitalism. I know you're not describing capitalism. If, you know, I, I, I might sign up to some of those ideas, but not under the heading of capitalism, because there are, you know, there are too many things attached to that word, you know, that, that concept, that abstract concept. So why don't you come up with another word? So it's a little bit like with um, G.K. Testerton and L.A. Belloc and, and distributism. Mm. Distributism isn't socialism. It's not capitalism. It's distributism. And, and it's a, a theory of, you know, how you do money and have, a, you know, a, be, a, a, a better, a better distribution of the pie. Right. So mm. it's not saying it's free stuff for everybody or people get free stuff from their stuff and all that sort of thing. So, uh, again, with this sort of neutral pronoun idea, and is it neutral? I mean, it, it, it's um, the point is, is that if you are a something else, so, you know, if you don't feel like a man or like a woman, you know, it, it, it's more complex than being a they or an it. It, that's not what it is. Now, um, I mean, if one is referring to oneself, I mean, it was Kierkegaard that said, "If once you label me, you negate me. And again, that's the, you know, um, I mean, I, I think everybody is unique and, and everybody is interesting. Um, quite often lots of us act in uninteresting ways and say deeply uninteresting things but you know everybody is unique and interesting um Bye. all right mate i'll see you later have a good day at school Bye. see ya love you love you too Bye. so you know that that's i wondered why it was number one such a big story and the thing it re reminded me of as well was Prince being a symbol and not Prince anymore because he fell out with his record company and he said, you know, um, you know, the artist formerly known as. Mm, you know, tough, tough cap. Getting into all of that, you know. Um, it's, it's funny that you say that because um, uh, surfing around the media yesterday, there were two other stories on top of the Chucka Immuna uh, and Rachel Riley stories that I noticed. <laughs> One of them was that Sinead O'Connor was on GMTV in the morning. Was uh, she? Yeah. She, these days? She, she, yeah. Seemed, she seemed pretty well, yeah. Well, that's she, good. Yeah. She banged out uh, Nothing Compares to You. Oh, and, what a song. What yeah, a singer. Yeah. yeah, it was very good. And she talked about how she mentioned that Prince was into pretty hard drugs at the time. And actually, when she met him, uh, I think he tried to beat her up and ran her Round and she couldn't really do much about it because she said she had the same manager as Prince and they were having some massive legal argument and she sort of got in the way. So that was interesting. And they asked about, they said, well, look, you're wearing the burqa or the veil or something like that. Uh, do you want to talk about that? And she said, yeah, well, you know, actually, I've always been, you would have liked this. She said, um, I've always been uh, a theologian. I've always read about um, See ya, love you too. I've always read about God and religion because mm -hmm. you know I come from a religious country, and I and she said I saved Islam till last when I was reading about different books, uh, different religions because I was so scared of it. Um, and actually, when I got to chapter two, I couldn't believe it. You know, everything made sense, um, and and so she talks about that a little bit. Um, so that was interesting. Um, also there was a program news night so i'm going to have to record that because i don't think that's going to be allowed to stay on the website for very long because mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes they put it on youtube forever as well some mm -hmm. reports i don't want to take the risk this one is about what they call hidden children's homes mm -hmm. or unregulated children's homes 
And one of the numbers they said was in the last four years, unregulated children's homes, I think they said unregulated, have gone up by 97 percent. And Mm -hmm. the first thing I thought was the deregulation bill. Why are you talking about? Why have you picked four years? What happened four years ago was the deregulation bill came through. And I remember at the time saying, hold on a second, I can see a clause in here. I mean, I don't go through every law in the world, but somebody had told me that there's a lot going on in this law. Um, And there was a law saying that they would privatise children's homes and the care system and stuff like that. And I remember thinking, I am absolutely not the only person who says, look, I am too old to go to a care home, but I can imagine a child having to do it. And I can't imagine this is going to be run properly under these circumstances, you know, in general. And um, I remember telephoning The Guardian, Rowena Mason, saying, I haven't seen any coverage of this in your political reporting, you know, very little. Um, And they said, well, you know, it's a busy time, blah, blah, blah. So then, you know, nothing happens. I contacted, listen to this, I'm sure I contacted the Children's Society Mm. about this. And now I find out, and they couldn't care less. They couldn't care less. I think that's a breeding ground for um, sort of new Labour politicians. But um, I saw that the reason for the report yesterday was because the Children's Society have done a report on it. And I just thought, ah, that makes so much sense. If the organisation who I went to, I turned to for help, uh, in this problem and ignored me then afterwards four years later when the problem has actually got much worse they mm. then they then take credit for doing the report and stuff and then raise funds off the back of it I thought oh that's so consistent with other things I've seen elsewhere depressing but you know if you don't get to see it if you don't do that four-year cycle you won't feel the same pain and insight that you would if you just were a bit suspicious on day one Mm. Um, so now I've seen that full cycle and I think hmm uh, if there's something that I'm going to grab hold of I'm far le- less likely to let go of it now mm. because I'm a bit more aware of what the consequences you know four years later you get this brilliant report into this huge amount of pain um, which was completely avoidable mm. um, you know I'd much rather not have the report actually and have the thing dealt with. And I found a Guardian article from four years ago talking about this. It would have been in the Guardian Society thing where someone mm. said, you're fucking going to do this, aren't you? What the fuck? But it's that section that gets ignored. So it means that I'm much more aware that the Guardian Society section and media section will occasionally say really good things, mm. uh, you know, important stuff. So that is another way for me, in my mind, of looking at Rachel Riley's behaviour with um with all of this other stuff because it's the deregulation agenda that's being pushed whilst whilst talking about you know they talking about you know the rabble the great unwashed as as an excuse do you know what i mean she's saying all of you lot you you poor uneducated people i mean i don't know if you saw i put a tweet out yesterday owen jones accused eddie dempsey I saw that. I, yeah. well, I saw. It. I didn't read what he'd said, but yeah. I saw Eddie's tweet, which I I, 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 I replied to it because on something like that, you know, not because I think oh Eddie Dempsey's brilliant or anything like that. I've hardly ever listened to him, um, and I can see why some. So people... the speech he gives on it's on YouTube, and um, the first yeah. speaker is a Guardian journalist. Yeah, no, I know. We're, we're talking about that. Yeah, so yeah, Larry, then it's Larry, Grace Blakey comes on, and then Eddie Dempsey comes on, and he and makes course, all of them look completely inauthentic, apart from, curiously Costa, enough, the Guardian journalist. Well, Costas is on there as well, Costas Lapovitsas as well. Yeah, um, well, he sent me to sleep, to be honest. I, I, sure. I, yeah. I mean, he's got, he's, got, he's got very similar views to you, though, on all of this stuff. Yeah, and, well, I uh, sent myself to sleep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean... I think if you're in the room, he's got he's got serious presence. Yeah. But um, but I think that it's really funny because with him, people don't know what to do because, you know, he's sort of, you know, on the spectrum of 
whiteness. You know, he's from within Fortress Europe, but he's completely against Fortress Europe. So I think people would look at him as if he was a sort of radical Islamist or something like that. They, they, they think of him as being a Brexit jihadi, I'm sure, because he's so off message for the academia and stuff like that. But anyway, Eddie Dempsey, he said... Uh, all that stuff is just... Uh, it's been ramped up to... to it, it has become the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, it really has. Yeah, but, um, but remember, he's on the Brexit side. So that's... I mean, I know, but I'm not saying about him, but I'm saying anybody that... Sure. The, yeah, the, the amount of self-censorship that's going on, and these people are talking about more censorship, more terror. So you, the great terror in France, uh, uh, you know, after the, the Brumier and all the rest of it, uh, but, 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 but also the Spanish Inquisition, you know, mm. you, 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 could, you can, without exaggerating, look at this current um, hate speech stuff and it is a new inquisition. It well, is I, a new great terror. Sure. Now, can I just say this? One reason that I think a conversation between us at 7.30 Swedish time uh, goes quite well is precisely, I mean, obviously, I know you've got stuff to do, uh, so supposedly have I, but it is precisely because the stakes are so low. You know, I mean, we're talking about important things in the wider world, but us ourselves, in terms of what we're talking about, you know, we're probably not even going to have a fight. You know, it's just we're talking about stuff. You know, we're not going to kill each other over what we're talking about. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't matter to us. It matters probably quite a lot more than it does to many other people who wouldn't talk at 7.30 in the morning. But um, when you have, and when this is why I find interesting, when you have people given a platform and they say things that they quite fundamentally believe, then suddenly with ease, their reputations exist, can be twisted, and suddenly they may say things in ways that they don't really mean or they don't really stand for. And so Owen Jones has basically said that Eddie Dempsey has sympathised with people that turn up at a Tommy Robinson rally and that those people are fascists and that Eddie Dempsey has said um, that those people rightfully hate uh, liberals or something like that. And so I said, because I thought, oh, look at this. This is major escalation here. So I said, um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I didn't say this, but don't get me wrong. I'm sure a Tommy Robinson uh, protest is a great place to identify fascists if that's your game but I think that there's going to be loads of people or certainly some well, people. In recent weeks the best place to do that was to go to the Lib Dem fucking conference mate Well I mean Chaka, <laughs> Chaka Amuna, his speech and everything like that, yeah exactly um, and just looking at the crowd but also I think that um, there's going to be people who have not fared well under the last few regimes and are looking for anything that is going to bring about change. Mm. And if you get, if you are told that you, you know, you're either your town or whatever it is, basically all your prospects are gone, whether you live in London or Nottingham or wherever, all your prospects are gone, all the things that your parents and their parents did. You can't do any of those things. Um, we're just going to say, right, OK, what's going on? You know, education Listen, system is I, terrible. Yeah. What, what, what this is all being presented as, Ranjan, is as if it's democracy a la carte. That, that, that's what it says on the tin. When what we really have is uh, the, the, the table de hotel. You know, it's a set menu. Now... Everybody's talking as if there are still discussions about what the choices are, right? And this is a a first order mistake in uh, in, in, in logic. Right. Okay. So there is no choice. Right? The, 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 there is no choice. You mean? 
Yeah, what, what, the, the, the establishment, okay, they know what they want, okay, and as they are in control of people's lives, you know, they just are, state monopoly on violence and also uh, complete and utter control over credit in the economy with basically most of the population are debt peons. So effectively, um, the very thin veneer of freedom is rubbing away in the friction uh, created from a transfer from one paradigm into another paradigm. Um, and the paradigm that the establishment are pushing us towards is this authoritarian um, uh, new version of feudalism, okay? There is a choice, and it's quite easy to implement the other choice, okay? Um, and, and there are other choices as well. Again, equally easy to implement um, with modern technology. Direct democracy is deliverable in real time with distributed computing. It just is, and it has been for, um, well, it has been since the days of Napster and Pirate Bay, peer-to-peer -peer communication. Now, the point you made about you and I talking at 7.30 this morning and about, well, is that important? Um, well, it's important to me. And, uh, you know, I enjoy our friendship and I really enjoy our discussions. And I learn a lot from, you know, all, all the stuff that you've read and the context that brings to, you know, questions that I want to ask. You know, it, it you know, this idea that um, when you share an idea, you don't end up with half an idea. The idea doubles. There are, you know, there are two ideas and exponentially from there. So. When, when one shares information, it doesn't mean that everybody gets less information. It means that it expands exponentially. Now, this is the point about where we're at and joining up human consciousness. And when I first encountered cloud computing, distributed computing in that sense, I, I, I started getting into um, trying to understand Rupert Sheldrake's theory of of, of morphic resonance um, and Graham Hancock also talks about this idea that you know our intelligence and our consciousness isn't just contained within our heads right we we we, we transmit and we receive frequencies at many different levels and the way that our brains work da David touched upon this in one of his um, uh, 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 programs about the thinking heart there are neurons around the heart and therefore being and, and, and there's lots of uh, valid and very high grade research uh, he interviews a professor I think it's at Cambridge University about this in one of his documentaries and um, so the the given settled science if you like that we're told it's it's all about the brain meat i mean an old friend of mine is, is basically what was his um uh, an eliminativist uh uh philosopher judd evans um and eliminativism is completely opposite to you know what when you referred to sinead o'connor referring to well, I, I read the Quran and it all fell in place. You know, for her, I'm sure that's true. Um, you know, I've read the Quran and I, I, I enjoyed reading the Quran. Um, and I, I've read the Bible and the Talmud, all this stuff, you know, I've read St. Augustine and um, what I can find of Pelagius and stuff. I've read a lot of um, religious writing. And my favourites, uh, my favourite is my Ammonides, but uh outside of everything the 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 best book i've ever read on that is, is um conversations with god uh, and it's the slimmest volume um but it took me about three months to read it because it's just the most amazing amazing book 
Um, once you get past the idea that this guy claims to be having a conversation directly with God, which I don't believe, um, but it it's a philosophy book more than a religious book. And that's the way I read religious texts. I read them as philosophy. And my own belief system is 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 uh, a very naturalistic one. You know, I do think there is a point and I do think there is such a thing as humanity. And I absolutely know and feel and bathe in love. I mean, I, I, I think love is the thing. Love is the way. Love is the light. Love is it. That is it. That is the point. Um, and I think that's um, and it's a question of accepting ourselves and loving ourselves, and then you know, there's a there's a phase of there's a phase of Christianity that is really big on all of that. What you just said, but I don't know when. I don't know if it's sort of twelfth century or something. Um, I remember once being in a conversation whilst I was teaching, and there was a Russian. Christian Russian friends with um, some of Putin's crowd and he he spoke to somebody else who he spoke to somebody else who was also Christian and they alluded to this they were talking about love and love for one another um, I'd never heard anything like that before Hello? Yeah. Um, I'm just saying, I remember hearing a conversation between two Christians, but of totally different, you know, persuasions. One was probably a Russian Orthodox and the other one I think was Spanish. And, you know, one of them was saying, oh, yeah, you know, something about man's love for, for the rest of humanity or something like that. But I don't know if it, this was an old form of Christianity or something. Can you shed any light on that? <laughs> it's a big sub subject, obviously. Um, the idea of a smiting God, a, a jealous God, you know, a, a, a God to be fearful of. Okay, I, I don't sign up to that. Um, the idea that God is some sort of egomaniac makes no sense to me whatsoever. You know, um, now. There's a play called Cenotaxus, which was written in the 12th century by a monk. Um, uh, and I think he founded one of the uh, one of the orders of monks or something. But Cenotaxus is a precursor to things like um, a picture of Dorian Gray and, and, and Faustus and you know, Marlowe's Dr. Faust and stuff. Mm. Um, and it predates that. Uh, but basically... The story is this very pious man dies and his soul isn't able to go to heaven. He, he, he becomes the undead because he's committed some terrible, terrible crime. And the crime which he's committed is the crime of pride. And it's basically saying that all the things that he did, he did out of pridefulness and now out of love. And this is what the, the background to this, this play is. I haven't found a production of this play everywhere. I found it in Latin and I found it in German. I haven't even found a British translation of it. Um, but there's a Cenoduxus, it's called, and, and, and there's an article about it on Wikipedia. So, I mean, you can sort of look that up. Um, but there's a whole strain of theology. There's revolution to it, revolutionary theology. And there's also the, the, the strain of theology that says that Christian teaching should get back to the Gospels. And the Gospels are about Jesus. Now, my take on Jesus, I mean, Jesus is obviously a Jew, right? And so Christianity is basically Judaism. But even um, even before Christ, you know, there, 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 there still was that strain of religion. Now, I uploaded the other day a documentary called The Last Druid, um, which was made in 1986. And it's very interesting because this Last Druid guy, talks about Pelagius, or Pelagius, as I call him, um, who was an Irish monk, who was a contemporary of St. Augustine. Um, and uh, they absolutely hated him, uh, the Roman church, because he uh, advocated for free will. Um, and uh, there's this big debate 
in Christianity between Calvinists and Lutherans and reformists and Puritans uh, with uh, the um, uh, within the Roman Church or the Catholic Church and then there's the Anglicans or whatever uh, and it's the question of salvation by by deeds or salvation by um, uh, preordination and and it boils down to um, and David Graeber is absolutely brilliant on this he wrote an essay in 1995 in a magazine called The Commoner it was about John Kerry and why John Kerry lost to um, George Bush the uh, second but he makes a point in it and the point is that all Western philosophy and ideas boil down to the argument between Heraclitus and Paramayanides, who are two philosophers, one of whom believed in free will, um, being Heraclitus, i.e. Uh, Pantare, everything flows, and uh, the other guy, Paramayanides, who said that there was no free will and that everything is preordained. Okay, And those two specific ideas, um, uh, one of them is very authoritarian, that is the, 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 the deterministic view, and the other is libertarian, which is the free will point of view. Now, I'm a Pelagian, believe in free will and all the rest of it. Um, I think, essentially, all Mohammedans, uh, what we call Muslims, um, regardless of whether they're Shias or Sunnis, okay, um, all Christians, regardless of denomination, and all Jews, you know, um, all people who love God, okay, so, you know, uh, love people of those other religions as well, but also people who aren't of them. I mean, it, it's not... Uh, the idea that, that um, because you get on your knees to God, that God is going to look upon that as, as being some sort of, you know, um, it's not. God is non-corporeal, OK? It's it's another idea. Um, and. God as an abstract idea or abstract ideas as God is perhaps a better way of putting it, you know. Um, to say you don't believe in God, in my world, is to say you don't believe in abstract ideas and the power of thought, the power of critical thought, the power of creative thought, the power of love, right? To me, that's what God is. And I see God in everything, in everyone, and in nature. Um, but also, I, you know, I see people struggling with choices every day, and we all do that, too. Um, and... Um, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, Jesus, he said lots of good things, according to the Bible. But one of them was removing the plank from your own eye before you take the splinter out of someone else's, you know, the, the moat, it's, it's referred to as a moat. Um, and uh, this is the, you know, going back to Rachel Riley and, you know, um, this idea of hate speech and who's defining it and all the rest of it. Um, they, they should spend less time... Um, hating on the haters, as it were, and a little bit more time actually loving themselves. Now, I, I, you know Osho's essay, Ego the False Centre. I mean, that, for me, is one of the most wonderful essays I've ever re read. Um, and this is the point. Um, do you hate me or do you hate my ego? Um, and ego is a a projected response to what is projected onto us from others. It, it, it really translates to and plays upon caring about what other people think of our, the appearance of us. Um, put another way, um, beauty is but skin deep. You know, I mean, these are the, all these aphorisms have, you know, a, a lot of really solid truth in them. Um, so, I'm going to get, let's go back to David Graeber again. I mean, the other thing, I mean, I, uh, you know, his shit jobs book or something. I mean, when he was sort of obviously building up to writing that, mm. uh, 
I, I watched one of his talk where he was sort of saying, what's the purpose of managers? Why, why are there managers? And he said, well, the purpose of managers is not to manage people, but to make people feel shit about themselves. So they do as they're told. And, you know, I mean, he's, he's right about so many things, you know. Um, uh, and yet, you know, I, I'm reminded of the Bob Dylan song, you know, you've got to serve somebody. You know, you may be the, da, 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 you know, the one you've got to serve somebody. Serve somebody, you know that you know the song, you know that song. Mm. Um, it sort of rings a bell, but yeah, it's a great song. Um, but I wonder, well, who is David serving? You know, um, and and we've discussed that before in the past because well, I love his work. Um, I mean, I I, I I poked fun at him the other day, sort of saying he was being narcissistic, uh, and he kind of shot back at me and I sort of say, well actually no that's not what I've said. I, I think your work is brilliant. But you know your 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 Twitter persona kind of belies that, you know, because I mean Twitter is the way that it's used is it's a narcissistic thing. To me it's a way of driving traffic to larger things. To me it, it, it's like the small ads in the back of a newspaper. It's a cheap way of advertising is what it is. Um, but what's important isn't what's on Twitter, it's what it points at and whether that's worthwhile reading. And the Twitter, uh, when you click on Twitter and go to something that's pointed at, that's the, that is the context in what that Twitter handle or that Twitter you know, account means. So when people say, you know, uh, a retweet is not an endorsement and all this sort of thing. Um, I, the, the kind of the social manners that grow out of that and the meaning that people sort of bring into it, it, it is testament to, you know, human storytelling um, and how many how many gaps we fill in with our pre pre digested um, views, as it were. So, I. So just to, just to be clear, you're saying everyone's got to serve somebody. And well, that's what the Bob Dylan song says. Uh, and, but and you're reminded of it when you see people tweeting around. And so what's your ultimate loyalty to? That's the kind of question that you're often yeah, asking. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there are two things that are very, very important in in, 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 in in taking any one piece of information. And those two things are what was the motivation behind what is being said? And in which context was it said? Um, so th this, you know... Meaning is not black and white, uh, which again then becomes the Duchamp idea about, you know, your own ideas that you bring to a one particular set of information. And John Lennon said this, as well as David Bowie and all the rest of it is someone asked John Lennon, what what does that song mean? And he says, well, I, I don't know. What does it mean to you? Because what it means to you and what it meant to me when I wrote it are two different things. And that well, I think I think in the case of John Lennon, it means. I was able to buy a swimming pool. Well, I, I mean, that's a, what you call it, a, a, a flippant kind of, do you see what I mean? I mean, it's a trivial response to, a, I mean, the, one thing that intrigued me some time ago, um, there's a quote attributed to John Lennon that someone asked him about what he learned at school or something or you know what what are you at school for are you to learn or whatever and, and and he gives some response to it about about what is the purpose of being there uh, and the uh, the storm this cooked up this is about five years ago um I was absolutely intrigued by this is why would someone even care that he said, I mean, I, I happen to think what he said, yeah, okay, I can see that's, that, 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 that chimes with me. Um, but the amount of um, troll activity that it attracted, if you, if you put that view forward, was huge. And this is the other point then about Rachel Riley and about what's happening on the internet. Um, 
you know, the armies of internet trolls. Um, I, I, I've uh, published a link to uh, the directions that got found there on the internet, which were given to one of, you know, 277 Signals Regiment and all the rest of it. You know, the, the, that's the army trolls. Um, you know, uh, the social media warriors, the paid hired help, if you like, of, of, of the propagandists. Um, and uh, our internet activity is closely managed, herded, and, 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 um, and celebrity is doing a job. You know, celebrities are not thinking. I'm not saying they're not capable of thinking and don't think. But what they say when they come on TV screens or what they put out is managed. And it's managed very carefully. And it's this is really clearly seen. Um, if you look at the Skripal interview uh, with the guy from Portnam Down, who's the ex-telephone salesman that somehow becomes the director of communication of the, you know, the weapons, chemical weapons establishment uh, thing, brought them down. Um, and there are, um, what's he called now? Um, oh, the ex-ambassador, um, Samarkand, uh, Craig Murray. Craig Murray says well if you look at it you can see there's a cut in it where he's not given the right idea so this is about bojo as foreign secretary basically saying well yes of course you know novichok of a type made in russia that's all this stuff right um and uh this guy he's red in the face and he's obviously been directed about what he is to say and he's clearly out of his depth right um but you know i he was clearly under some sort of threat of a David Kelly type of moment in the woods if he didn't get his lines right. Um, and the degree of um, dressing and product placement that is in the news media, which is put into the mainstream for general uh, teaching purposes, you know, to teach us all to be good quiet citizens to talk when talk to all of that stuff um it, it's all on display and i i think this anti-semitism rachel riley gary lineker stuff is all part of that um and it has become absurd it's become completely absurd um and uh i'm reminded the article that appeared in um off guardian about uh, propaganda why it doesn't need to be even convincing uh the point of propaganda isn't to convince anyone of anything. It's actually to see if people are sufficiently compliant just to regurgitate it. And that's all your job is. You don't even have to believe it, but you have to. Uh, in the same way as when O'Brien is torturing Winston in in uh, in 1984 and he's saying, how many fingers am I holding up? Uh, and he's holding up four fingers and saying it's two. And he gets Winston to say you're holding up two fingers when everybody can see that it's actually four. And that, that is what's happening. It's that. Amazing. Roger, I think it's a good time for me to get some exercise, get out of the house a little bit. But um, yeah, brilliant talking to you. Um, how's the whole wiki thing happening? I'm uh, busy, busy, busy. I mean, I've, I've done. I did a live a live stream this morning. Um, I'm playing with Beaker Browser and the Electron Browser, um, which are implementations of peer-to-peer -peer computing, um, which are similar to Open Internet Protocol, um, but aren't, but don't need any cryptocurrencies. Um, and I've been having a discussion with. Um, uh devon about indexing and why 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 does the indexing need to be in a blockchain I, I i'm not convinced that it needs to be in a blockchain i'm convinced of the need for blockchain for other stuff um but uh we can publish um grub street 
already and I'm just figuring out either on Electron or Beaker uh, what user interface to offer our writers and our mul multimedia. Multimedia journalism is what it is that, that, that Grub Street represents, but it's thinking of multimedia information. Um, and it's incredibly powerful. I mean, everyone can be William Blake, you know, with his wonderful sort of etchings and drawings and paintings and poems and, you know, uh, fragments, you know, uh, Zanudox, Zanudu, you know, the, the Coleridge um, poem, Kubla Khan, um, you know, it, it, it published as a fragment, you know, uh, it's a great poem if you don't know it. It's fantastic. It's one of the most famous poems in English. He's a big. Um, he was a big um, opium smoker, right? Yes. Yeah. He smoked opium. Um, this is so. This is the mixed race Samuel Coleridge. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. You're talking about. I. Because there's I'm, two out there. There's there's two Coleridges out there. There's a Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and there's another one as well. It's Samuel Taylor Coleridge that I'm talking about. Who wrote? Um, who, who okay. Wrote Kubla Khan, the poet. Yeah, sorry. So tell me about the fragment thing. Yeah, um, and uh, it's a it's a poem about poetry and a poem about meaning and a poem about all the stuff we're talking about about um, how people perceive information, the intention behind, the motivation and the context. How important that is. And when I first got into context and motivations, actually in arguing about algorithms and, 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 and people saying that algorithms are some pure expression of scientific truth. And I was at pains to point out, actually, no, they're not, because you have to have limits in any algorithm for it to have any, any, uh, any worth whatsoever. And the limits are basically come from the motivation and the intention of whoever it is that's defining the limits within which the algorithm takes its inputs, as it were. Um, and so, no, mathematics is actually a matter of opinion, a matter of art, taste, and, you know, fiddling around the edges, if you will. Um, then you get into trouble, you know, you, you, you run into the danger of people saying, oh, that makes you a moral relativist or whatever. And actually, um, to me, I think those are all separate questions. When it comes down to uh, the question of, you know, is mass discovered or is it an artifact, as Stephen Wolfram thinks it is, I think it's an artifact. Um, and it's not discovered. It, 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 it's, you know, it's invented. It's a way of describing stuff which ultimately is indescribable but we can take we, we can describe a snapshot at certain points in time and make some valuable predictions from that so does, does that mean does that mean that you're a platonist no um do you believe that numbers are real no i mean i i, I mean i <laughs> It, they're, it, they're, it's their abstract thoughts. Language is... is, is, is it's is, very, yeah, it's very is, interesting. It's a concrete representation of an abstract conceptualization. So you're I, more, so you're more of a, a lock person? No, not really. I mean, I'm, I, 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 um, it was Hume that refuted Bishop Bar Barclay by um, kicking a rock and saying, I refute him thus. Right? Mm. Now, i.e. the material world does exist because you can break your foot are you, know? you are you a um, non-dualist <sighs> and may i in advance no, I, i'm a pelagian i believe in free will <laughs> at, at its root that's you know so and and, and i i'm also a very keen student student of my Ammonides, okay, um, but also of Avicinia and all this sort of thing. Can you so, send me? Can you send me a couple of links to these things? Um, yeah, well, I can do. But I mean, I um, 
I mean, I write about lots of these things in my blog. I mean, it's it's all in there. Um, but um, all right. I tell you, the last Druid guy, the last video I watched, and he, he mentions Pelagius, and it's really important what he says. I mean, I wrote a blog about um, Brexit to do uh, 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 quoting Tacitus and um, talking about the Roman invasion of Britain and how they basically c civilized the Britons by you know giving them bells and whistles you know um, things that they called civilization were actually just emblems of their enslavement this is this is Tacitus talking about the, the second invasion Roger by Roger, the, Roger by the, the, thing, the thing is if I have a conversation with you then um, I find it not that difficult to follow you I think but if I read a blog post then I think what I find is, or even a social media, anything where you have to sort of interact with people online, I see basically you do sort of remind me a little bit of Ezra Pound. And um, when I say that, you know I have a lot of time for Ezra Pound. I, I, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, good. I remember I remember once I, one of the... Um, few genuinely smart people i've ever taught or basically we used to have these conversations twice a week uh he was uh, at the top of this kind of spanish business system and uh i remember i think at some point i was thinking of Ezra pound and he we basically just said what must it be like for certain people for example someone like ezra pound to be around other people i mean you know i know that you're no misanthrope and i don't think he was either but you know, to know that you you can't really explore some of your thoughts around people because they're just not going to understand what the fuck you're talking about. Um, then afterwards, I mean, I know that I've tried to be much friendlier in the way that I write, and I'm sure that people will still look at it and say, "Well, I'm like that." You know, I try to do whole sentences and shit like that. <laughs> I can't be asked. I'd rather I think just say "fuck you, everybody," and stick no, a couple of. Read Kubla Khan. I mean, it. You know, it... Coleridge knew, Pound knew, Blake knew. Um, you know, Stevie Smith knew. Um, guy, poetry. Poetry is the thing. I mean. Um... Okay. Po po poetry. I I'm happiest when I write a poem about something. To mm. me, that you know, and if, and then it's there, and I can then, I'm quite happy to talk to anybody. Well, and when I put my big poems up, um, I, there were always tons and tons of notes, and I've written found poems. You know, I wrote one found poem. Uh, uh, what a poem about pound or pound style? No, no, no. Um, it's uh, the one about globalization, and it's basically made up of, of snippets of stuff that I've read and placed in this found poem. I mean, I quite like it, but it, as you go through it, it starts off as a poem, lifting myths from the poet's page and all this sort of thing, which is a quote from um, uh, W.G. Wells. Um, HG. Before I before I wrote that poem, I read every single word that Wells ever wrote um, of nonfiction, every single fucking word, and and that's it's a bit like Will Cuppy who wrote the rise and fall of just about everybody. That's how he worked. He, before he would write a single word, he wanted to, you know, find uh, you know just just to think right, okay, I you know. So I'm not interested in what other people think. I'm interested in where it fits in the universe. Right. And to me, what I'm doing is I'm just transmitting my thoughts into the morphic resonance space. And it's for other people to figure out what the fuck it means, because I don't fucking know. Brilliant. I think I shall have to adopt a similar approach, actually. Um, the morphic resonance. I mean, I saw Rupert Sheldrake came up in something that I was looking at again the other day. Uh, he comes up quite a bit. I think somebody, somebody, so a friend of a friend sort of knows them. Um, 
But again, I'm sure the Morphic Resonance view would be that that really doesn't matter. <laughs> um, cool. Um, Roger? Good have talking. A, yeah, have a brilliant day. Catch up soon. Uh, and you. Take care. Thanks nice to you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.